you can be uh, seated. I started a series a week ago, and I, I would like to be transparent uh, with you uh, and just say that I had not experienced that degree of struggle in the delivery of a message in many years. And I, I understand and believe that the content of what I'm sharing with you uh, in the area of spiritual warfare would be deemed very dangerous. Uh, the enemy of our soul hates content like this. I do want to set a little bit of a foundation for you. I'm going to read a couple of verses of scripture. Please be attentive uh, with these scripture verses. There's, there's a, a concept, a conceptual I'm trying to get you to see as a believer, especially in the day that we live in right now. I'll be in Genesis. I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture, string them together, and paint a little bit of a picture for you. I'm beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, familiar portions of Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 tells us a conditional situation of the earth. It says, and the earth was without form. It was void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The earth was in a chaotic form. There was no sustainable life because the earth was in such a disarray and such a circumstance that life could not be uh, sustained. And the spirit of the Lord God moved upon the face of the waters. And now God begins what we call the recreation of the earth. And in the six days, he is going to bring order to that which is chaotic. And he begins with this first portion of the first day and says, and let there be light because there was darkness and the light had not yet pierced the darkness and there was light. Verse four tells us, and God saw the light that it was good and he divided the light from the darkness. He divided the light from the darkness. The actual Hebrew word here is badal. He brought separation between the light and the darkness. In the creative form, God is going to be, be bringing division and separation to the things that he creates because life to be dis sustained needs to have separation. He goes on here and says in verse 6, and God said, let the firmament of the midst of the waters, let it be divided, the waters from above, from the waters below. Verse 7 says, and God made a firmament, and he divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven, and he called the evening and the morning, and it was the second day, and he brought division there. Um, in order for God to bring land, he causes the water to divide itself from the land and he brings division. So now there is land and there is seas. There's land and seas. The Hebrew word badal for division or separation grows over the next thousand years in the Hebrew language. And it means bringing separate boundaries, separate species, separate peoples. It's the division of Jew and Gentiles, the division of culture. It's the division of spirit and earth. It's the division of realms. And God just simply is saying here that I'm going to bring division. And the areas that he brings division, he then creates life in. So he divides the water. And in the waters, he creates life. He divides the earth. And in the earth, he brings life out of the earth. He brings simple division. When he creates man, he brings division to those things. He divides the night from the day and he begins to bring forth life in verse 11, uh, Genesis chapter one, verse 11. And the Lord God said, let the earth bring forth grass and the herb yielding seed and fruit trees yielding fruit after its own kind. So the kind would be the species. When God wanted to create vegetation, he spoke to the important part of the vegetation. If you're taking notes, write this down because you must see God as the God of environments. Let me say that again. You must see God as the God of environments. He's not just God. He's not just the God of the earth. He's not just the God of a believer. He's not just our Lord and Savior. He is the God of environments. And so God speaks to the environment, and out of the environment comes life. Because life can't be sustained outside of an environment. 
That was deep. I'll say it again because it's important. So look at the verse of scripture. And God said, let the earth bring forth trees. Let the earth bring forth fruit. He then speaks to the waters. Let the waters bring forth fish. Why? Because the waters is the environment for the fish and the fish to survive needs to be in the environment of water. Take the fish out of the water, it dies. You so good? Take the tree out of the earth, it dies. Needs to be potted again. In fact, it's dangerous just to repot vegetation because it causes a rupture to be taken out of the environment and placed in a different environment. My kids had goldfish when they were younger and you'd go to the store to get the fish and they would, they would not just, they would make sure that you took the fish, the fish was in the water that was in the tank. When you took the fish home, you had to put the fish in the bag, leave the fish in the bag, put the bag in the water and make sure that the water in the bag was getting touched by the atmosphere of the water in the tank at your house and then ease the fish out of that water into the environment of your tank because your tank was a different environment than that which the fish was raised in. You still good this morning? So God is the God of environments. We see this in the most simplest form. He creates man, and when he creates man, he creates an environment for him. The Bible says that God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put all vegetation, and there he put trees, and there he put grass, and there he put animals. And the Bible says, and he took man, and he placed him in the garden, because God knew for man to be successful, he needed to be in the right environment. There's two different, you would say, kings that are, mentioned up here or seen up here. So the lion is the king of the jungle. And then we come over to the ocean and you look at the fierceness of the great white shark and you would say that in the environment of the water, it does not have a predator. There's nobody chasing after a great white shark. And in the space of time, if the king of the jungle had a fight with the king of the ocean... And the lion got upset with the shark because the shark came to the shoreline and took its paw, put it into the shark and dragged the shark out of the water and onto the sands. Then the shark would begin to fear because it's being lured into an environment that it cannot win. Though it is a king, it is not a king in the environment of the jungle. And they would fight back and forth. And the lion would be so enthralled that you cannot beat me. It drags the shark out of the water. The shark cannot breathe. It cannot, it's flapping its fin. It can't do anything. But then the shark begins to back itself into the water, grabs a hold of the foot of the lion and starts to drag the lion into the water. Well, the lion doesn't realize it. It's infatuated with the thrill of the fight. It is in the midst of anger and victory, and it gets drawn into the water. It gets drawn in a little bit more to the water, and all of a sudden, the lion can't touch the ground. Guess what begins to happen? The shark begins to win because the king of the jungle wasn't meant to survive in the environment of the water. Do you know what the devil does to me and you? He lures the believer into environments you cannot win. Either you're a deer caught in a headlight. This is so important. This is the battle for believers. Is that the enemy is constantly, since God was the person or God was the a uh, giver of environments, so the enemy tries to create an environment. And he lures believers out of the environment where they can operate and flourish and lures us into an environment where we are not successful. I'm gonna keep plugging along here. God created an environment for Adam before he created Adam. Created earth, atmosphere, food, oxygen, heat, seasons. He created companionship. He created authority. He created leadership. He created all of these things and he placed Adam in an environment where Adam can flourish. 
He created an environment where Adam can flourish. Satan then must lure mankind into an environment by using the tools such as he creates situations, he creates conversations, he creates relationships, he creates tensions, he creates trials, he creates things that happen in order to lure us out of an environment of safety and protection. Oh, the garden is a place of safety and protection. It is a place where Adam and Eve can flourish. I mean, think about it. Adam and Eve are created. There's no sin. There's no disease. They're given pure authority. There's no fracture in their DNA. There's no fracture in their mind. There's no fear. There's no psychological issues. There's no depression. There's no medication. There's no psychologist. Dr. Phil is not in the garden. It is a perfect environment. It is an environment for Adam and Eve to flourish. And God places one boundary there. He says, listen, every environment, every environment I create has boundaries and atmospheres. If you're taking notes, write this down. Because every environment, the God of environments who creates environments, makes sure that there are boundaries to the environment and there are atmospheres to the environment, and he simply tells Adam, here is the boundary of the environment that I've created in the garden. You can eat of everything, but of the tree, of the knowledge, and good and evil, that's a boundary, and you're to not eat of it. For the day you eat of it, you will not have victory at that tree. You were not made to flourish if you eat of that tree. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. That's the boundary. That will create an atmosphere that is not conducive for you to be successful. So the enemy is going to use tension. He's going to use relationship. He's going to use temptation. He's going to lure. He has to lure Adam and Eve into an environment that is not conducive for Adam's leadership. Up until this point, Adam was told to take dominion in the garden. He has dominion, he has authority, he's created in the likeness of God, he's created in the image of God. When God creates man, if, if the environment of the creation of animals is the earth, the environment of the sea creatures is the ocean, then when God creates Adam, he breathes into him, God doesn't speak to the earth. He uses the earth to fashion Adam. He creates a shell for Adam and breathes into him. But God spoke to himself. So what he was saying to Adam and Eve, he was saying to Adam, you're going to be created in my likeness and my image. I'm the environment for you to flourish. When God wanted to make man, he spoke to himself. When God wanted to create the fish, he spoke to the ocean. And when God wanted to create the animals, he spoke to the earth. And when God wanted to create a rose bush, he spoke to the earth. Take the rose bush out of the earth, it dies. Take the fish out of the water, it dies. Take man out of God, it dies. The entire attack of the enemy to get you out of God, to lure you out of the environment that produces leadership, sustainable relationship with God, and lure you into an environment that's not conducive for God to flourish in you, that will quench the Holy Spirit. This is good preaching. I'm just going to keep plugging along here. Boundaries. Environments are governed by boundaries and atmospheres. I'll speak to the boundaries first, quickly. Proverbs 4.14, enter not in the path of the wicked, path of the wicked, boundaries. So there's boundaries. So what we try to teach our kids when we raise them, we try to teach them about boundaries. No, 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 no. You can't just run all over the place. Hold on to mommy's hand. We're going to the mall. We're going to go to the mall. There's boundaries. You can't be two feet away from me. Why? Because there's crazy people in the world. There's psychopaths. There's there's crazy individuals. You, You create boundaries for them. 
You create boundaries in the house. You can go here, you can't go there. Don't go near the stove. It's a boundary, you're going to get hurt. We, we instinctively create boundaries. When they begin to have friends, we begin to, we begin to assess their friends because they don't have the jurisprudence as young kids to know the difference between good friends and bad friends. So you set boundaries. Bad friends corrupt good morals. You begin to set boundaries. Come, come to Jesus in the church. The church in the past that had been legalistic was with the attempt to set boundaries. We don't want to be legalistic, but there are some boundaries that you should know about. I'm not going to tell you who to date, but there are some biblical boundaries. If you're a single lady, don't date an unsaved guy. Some of you are shocked. What? Because there's boundaries. Apostle Paul says, don't be unequally yoked. Why? Because that's a boundary. I'll just keep plugging along here. Proverbs 4.14, enter not in the path of the wicked and go not in the way of the evil doer. Boundaries. So all boundaries, if you're taking notes, environments are governed by boundaries and atmospheres. Boundaries and atmosphere. Boundaries are the perimeters of safety. When Jesus tells the disciples, go preach, he tells them where to go. Go only to the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go into the way of the Gentiles. Why? Because we still have a boundary there. We we have a boundary there. Atmospheres are divided into two categories. You might not realize this, but you could just you could just look up the definition for atmosphere and they're di- and it is divided into two categories. The first would be air, sky, heaven, atmosphere, surrounding, climate, elements, habitats. That is the most natural way we see an atmosphere. So if atmospheres are divided into two categories, one of them is climate. Danny and Eva are moving to Florida, different atmosphere. I lived in Florida for a year. I could have been a weatherman there. Every day was hazy, hot, and humid, chance of rain. (laughs) Somewhere around 3 o'clock, the heavens couldn't even take it any longer. It was so hot. These are, these are climates. So if you're a discerning believer, one of the areas of maturity and growth is for you to assess environments. If I give you any wisdom today, it has been for the last 31 years as a believer, and even before being a believer, as a runaway at 16 years old, uh, growing up in an abusive home, being on my own at such a young age, I instinctively began to be concerned about certain environments that were healthy for me at 16. And unhealthy for me. Certain parties my friends would want to go to, I felt uncomfortable because I knew this was not a good environment for me to be in. I don't have a past in drugs and alcohol, even though I started drug and alcohol centers. I seen what alcohol did to my father and growing up in an abusive home. I ran from those things. But at 16, being on my own, sleeping in my car at night, trying to graduate high school, I begin to assess environments. I begin to look at people and look beyond what I see because the book always, the cover always didn't match the book that was internally there. There's a name for that or whatever. I forgot what it is. So in assessment of surroundings and climates and elements, we've been to the mission field numerous times. I've traveled all over the world. First thing I do when I get off the plane, I start to check out environments. Does that make sense? I start, I start checking out the environment. So two categories for atmospheres. First part of the atmosphere is air. That's the natural atmosphere, sky, heavens, surroundings, climate. There are certain surroundings and there are certain atmospheres that are unhealthy for a believer. You good today? Turn to somebody and say, this guy's good. Oh my God, tell your other ear that. The second category of atmospheres is feelings. So the first is under air. The second is under feelings. Feelings is divided into tone, mood, tempers, ambience, vibe, spirit, aura, flavor, impression. Each of those things also sets an atmosphere. Let me say that again. Light a candle, dim the lights. You with me? Get some roses. If I were to set up a table 
and you visited my house, and when you walked in, there were roses on the table. You just happened to show up at my house unannounced. Boundaries. See, I already violated that boundary. Came in, and you seen two place settings, and you seen a candle lit and roses, and Luther Vandross playing. Don't ask what am I about to get involved in. The mood was already set. Does that make sense? Even if you're not in the mood, the atmosphere begins to bring you in the mood. Is that good? You okay? So then, so then if environments are governed by atmosphere and environments are governed by moods, then the enemy only needs to change your mood to get you out of the will of God. Are you, are you still there? Oh, okay, so let's not deal with, oh, is this environment? No, no, no. Let's move out of the air environment and into the feeling environment. And let's check out the tone. Let's check out the ambience. Let's check out the vibe because the enemy is going to use feelings to begin to deceive Eve in order to get her out of the land and over to the tree. So the shark begins to speak to the king of the jungle and the enemy, the serpent, begins to change your mood when it comes to God. Did God really say that you cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, God knows in the day that you eat thereof that you shall be like him. Boy, I tell you, you got to get in the right mood. I mean, God's holding something back from you. You're being cheated and her mood begins to change. Her mood changes the atmosphere. The atmosphere changes the environment and the environment now isn't conducive for God to thrive in. And so it is, the enemy uses these things, these things. This is what happens to Samson and Delilah. Delilah set a certain mood. This is what happens in the 21st century. The enemy uses not just the atmosphere or the elements. He uses the mood. You still good? I find four environments that Satan uses to afflict the believer. I'm only going to look at one of them today. The first environment and the most deadly of the environments that the enemy uses. So remember, the devil, in order to be successful, has to get you out of the environment and boundary and atmosphere that God has placed over you. Does that, does that make sense? So when I mean God's perfect will, standing on the rock and I am in the environment that God has created for me, then the enemy comes around. Eve and Adam are in a perfect environment, and if they're going to be deceived, don't think that you're above deception by the enemy. And so the enemy is going to come at Adam and Eve. He doesn't really come at Adam. He waits till Adam gets married, and then he begins to attack him. Because Adam has oneness of mind, and all he's doing is fellowshipping with God. But then Adam begins his marriage relationship. He says some amazing things in marriage, which is shocking. And I know that we quoted in the wedding ceremony because Adam, when he looked at Eve, he made the comment and it had become almost a clarion call that now shall a man leave his father and cleave unto his wife. Well, in the garden, who's the father? Now, I got after 4,000 years of in-laws and outlaws, crazy families, that it is wisdom to tell a young couple to make sure that your families don't influence your marriage. I got that. Good 101, good counsel. But in the garden, in the garden, back to perfection, back to a place of a utopian environment, at, back to a guy that doesn't have a belly button. He's basically saying, thanks God, thanks dad for the woman But I'm going to leave you to cleave to her. Where did that instruction come from? Shouldn't you bring her to you to help cleave to him? 
Shouldn't you then lead Eve to God? You came out of me, but I came from him. We together are under God's authority. God is our father, Abba Father. The restoration in salvation is to bring us to adoption again. The fracture of relationship in the garden separated. As soon as he made that declaration, the devil knew, okay, I got this now. He's going to leave God to cleave to her. Now I only got to get him. While he's cleaving to God, I got no way to tempt him. I got no way to overcome him because he's cleaving to God. Him and God are like this. But now, now he makes that declaration. Environments. Number one environment the enemy uses, which the Bible warns us of, there are over 365 references warning believers about fear. An environment of fear that can afflict the believer. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus addresses it in the parable of the talents. Verse 24, he that received the one talent came and said to the Lord, I know that thou art a hard man. Thou hast reaped where you have not sown, and you have gathered where you have not strawed. I was afraid. I was afraid. And I went and hid my talent in the earth. Lo, thou hast at this time, Paul writing to Timothy, gives warning in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us, again, the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound man. Notice that, a sound mind. There's warning in the scripture about an environment of fear that for a believer, it is not conducive for the relationship with the Lord. The verse that Paul writes to Timothy takes it up a notch. This verse says he has not given us a spirit of fear. Two interpretations for that word. It is in its most extreme sense, fear can open you up to a affliction, a demonic affliction of fear and or a principality of fear. If you're taking notes, write this down, very important. So the two progressions of the spirit of fear is one, you can open yourself up to a demonic oppression of fear. A demonic oppression of fear afflicts the believer. A principality of fear afflicts a territory. You say, can it afflict the territory? Yeah. Look at our nation. Look at our nation. We have just got past an epidemic of two years, and it wouldn't take a novice or even a early babe in Christ to recognize that fear played a role in the last couple of years. A principality of fear. It was being used in Egypt over the uh, Jews, was the taskmasters putting a nation under fear using manipulation, using all sorts of things, an epidemic. Whenever you see a storm come, what do people normally do? The lines to get gas. Is this just lines to get gas, shortages, toilet paper? I still got a lot of toilet If you run out of toilet paper, see me. We got lots of toilet paper. It's hard as a rock, but it'll work. It's like I got it from Sam's dad, Amen. In Romans 8, 15, it says, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Bondage, fear. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. So the enemy to which Paul says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, then the enemy needs to begin to take you out of the environment where you have power, where love is sustainable, not love between me and you. I mean, I, I, that would be great if you loved me. Be even more amazing if I loved you. You still, you still there? 
But more important than your love for me and my love for you is understanding God's love for me. And the scripture verse is telling us, don't be moved from your love for God. God has given you a sound mind. Mind, fear affects the intellect. It affects our emotions. It affects, it begins to pull us away from a place of safety and security that God is for me and not against me. Romans 8, 15, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We're not just servants in the house of God. We're sons and daughters of the living God. You don't need to fear bondage. You don't need to fear affliction. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love cast out fear because fear has torment. So what does the enemy do? He visits us. You might be attending church today, but fear and intimidation and manipulation is being used by the enemy to afflict you. To begin to move the environment of safety and progression, the safety of love. This verse of scripture says, perfect love casts out fear. When I begin to get fearful and I begin to fear the issues that are happening, flipping through the channels, fear of just normal stuff, raising children in the first 21st century, fear of how am I going to meet debts, fear of leadership, how can I handle these things in the church when the building collapses, fear, how am I going to navigate these things? When fear begins to settle itself, it shifts me from the environment of safety and security and moves me away. Now I begin to question God, what's going on here? Soon as that begins to rupture my relationship with the Lord, it's like the enemy, like a shark, is dragging me into the waters. He's dragging me into an environment that I cannot thrive in. Say, God, over the years that I've had enough sense that the Holy Spirit has quickened me enough to begin to shake off the water, drag myself out of the water and back on solid ground and say, wait a second, at the end of the day, God loves me. He's not against me. So, can I just say something? God didn't die for you when you were doing good. In fact, he died for you before you were born. He made provision for you when you were yet a sinner. Sin doesn't shock him. Shocks you, shocks me. Right? Doesn't shock him. He's made provision for those things. And he loved us anyway. Does that make sense? He doesn't, Jesus doesn't turn to the thief on the cross and say, I can't believe you're actually asking for me to remember you when I come into my kingdom. Know you not that you're a sinner? This was Jesus' argument with the Pharisees of the day. They only supped with those who looked holy. Jesus said, I come for the sinner. I'm going to keep plugging along here. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Some areas that you're not made perfect. Your salvation is not matured in crisis to know that no matter what you do, though God might not be pleased with what you do, and though you'll reap the consequences of what you do, God always loves you. Let me say that again, because I know that's shocking. So I have two sons. No matter what they've gone through in life, my love for them has never changed. My disapproval of some of the stuff they did, I've been vocal in that. And when they've made mistakes, they never should have to question whether their mother and father love them. Oh, we love you. We've been waiting for you to come home. Just like the father of the prodigal son, he was waiting every day. When are you coming home? Why? Because I love you. That's why. I love it. You're not coming back as a servant. You're not being downgraded in the house because of the circumstances and situation that you've been in. Oh, you're going to reap the, the situation and the, and the cause and effect of what you do. But love? Does that make sense? Love? 
If you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus, I can tell you at 1,000% assurity that Jesus died for you. I have no question in that. There's no theological shift in me. There's no, there's no um, uh, wavering when it comes to that. And though we can say that to the sinner, sometimes we have difficulty saying that to the believer who fell. So we open up the red carpet. We celebrate, give a hand clap. Sinner came to save grace. But anyone who's recommitting our Lord, sneak up to the altar quietly. We'll smuggle you back into the fall later. Still good? I want to keep plugging along here. John 13, 24, when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in his spirit and testified, verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And the disciples looked to one another, doubting whom he spoke of. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom. Luke tells us it is John, one of the disciples whom Jesus loved. So John was the youngest of the disciples uh, that is there. They're at the Last Supper, 12 disciples. Jesus says, someone's going to betray you. And they all knew that there was somebody in the room whose love was perfected that wasn't even moved by the circumstance of betrayal. So they began to ask amongst themselves, who do you think it is? Matthew begins to ask Thomas, who do you think it is? Judas just questions and says, well, it isn't me. Peter then turns, rather than ask Jesus, who's going to betray him? He asks the disciple whose love for Jesus was perfected, who's just sitting in the bosom of Jesus. He says, you ask him, why? Because your love is perfected. And sometimes I think I'm at odds with Jesus. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear stops you from your destiny. Let me say it again. Fear stops you from reaching your destiny. It was fear that stopped Israel from inheriting the promised land. Oh, absolutely. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 27, they had seen the hand of God. They, have seen, they had seen 10 miracles. Not only the 10 miracles, but they seen the Red Sea open up. They seen the angel of death pass over. They walked in the midst of the Red Sea. The waters took over. They sung dances. Mary and danced and sung songs about the Lord's power over the horsemen of Egypt as the waters swallowed up Pharaoh's army. Yet they get to the land of Canaan. They send out spies in the land of Canaan. And they came back and they told Moses, we came unto the land which thou sent us, or you sent us, and surely it is flowing with milk and honey. And here is the fruit thereof. They brought back the fruit of the ground. Nevertheless, you know it's going to be bad news when it's nevertheless rather than never the more. Nevertheless, the people are strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled. They are very great. And we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, they dwell in the mountains. The Anak were giants in the land. So they got there and the rock was there and Arnold Schwarzenegger was there. Are you, are you with me? They looked, they saw nine foot, nine giants in the land. And they saw that. They saw the walls of the walls of Canaan, the walled cities. And they said to Moses, we are but grasshoppers. We are not able to stand against them. Fear. They saw with their eyes fear. They didn't trust God. It's perfect love. If they knew how much God loved them, if love had been perfect in their heart, if they understood the adoption through, through uh, Abraham, if they understood that God was for them and not against them and would never risk them, they would have responded that we're able to go against them. Only two of them, Aaron and her, or Cain or Cable, Abel, and who are the two? What was that? Caleb and Joshua. Just want to make sure you're listening. <laughs> the definition of fear is distressing emotion aroused by impending danger, by evil, by pain, and by emotional discomfort. Begins in the imagination, 
and begins to have a condition on the physical realm. Fear begins psychological. Fear. It's the first thing Adam experienced when he sinned against God. The Bible says that when they heard God walking in the garden, they feared God and hid from him. They hid from God. Very quickly, let me just give you a couple. You write, not, write this down. Here's, here's a couple warnings that you might be operating under fear. Number one is that you might have had a love break or love resistance in your relationship with God. We do marriage counsel over the years and just because two people live in the house together doesn't mean there's not undercurrents. I know people that have been married for years and they've been unhappy for years. It is possible for you to serve God in a marriage relationship with Jesus for 20 years, but have an undercurrent. Oh, you're in the same house, you worship, dinner's on the table, but there's not a level of intimacy that God intended. It is possible for you to be able to serve God, but yet have disappointment in you. Disappointment of destiny not fulfilled, children not serving the Lord, sickness that's come upon you. Trial and tribulation. Oh, you're at church, but there's a love break. Maybe it was a life struggle, difficulty. It's the enemy arousing questions, trying to move you from an environment that you can flourish in. 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Do you have a love break? Parable of the talents, the man had a love break between himself and the master of the house. And I've seen it for years. I've seen Christians who complain often. They complain about God. They complain about situations. They complain about everything. When you're complaining about the environment, situation, the atmosphere, what's happening around you, the lot that's been given to you, then your love in Christ has not been made perfect. You only got to read through the Bible. You only got to look at Naomi. You only got to look at Ruth. You only got to look at Rahab. Rather than complain, they got up. Rahab could have complained. She didn't complain. She gave up swinging her on a pole. Trust God. Believe in God. 21st century in the day we live in where there's more chaos and darkness than we've ever seen before in previous generations, I would challenge you today, make sure your love relationship and intimacy with God does not break. Do not be moved from your adoption in Christ Jesus. Do not be moved by what you hear and the propaganda and the proliferation of fear and the fear mongerers. Get yourself away from those things and, and come to grips with extremes. Here's the extreme. What's the worst that can happen to me? I die. That's my advantage. Let me say it again. I die. That's why I didn't know, do, know what to do with Paul. They said, Paul, we're going to kill you. He said, to die is gain. He said, I'd rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord. You know what they said around him? Don't kill him. He's too happy. So they said, all right, so happy about death? Never seen a guy like you before? We're going to let you live. He was like, to live is Christ. They said, well, we can't kill him. He's alive. So let's inflict him with prison. He says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. He writes 10 epistles in prison. They didn't know what to do with Paul. Because Paul would not be moved from his environment of God's love for him. God loves me no matter what the circumstance is. God loves me no matter what the circumstance is. God loves me when I'm sick. God loves me when I'm healthy. God loves me when I trip. God loves me when I make a mistake. God loves me. You still good? Second one would be avoiding prayer, the Bible, and I'll put church last. When you begin to avoid the Bible, you don't want to read, you don't want to pray. It's been said there's only three responses to fear. Here they are. Fight, flight, or freeze. Fight, let's go at it. Flight, let's run. Freeze, I don't know what to do. 
And so it is, that's the response. Sometimes this leads us to flee the thing that would help us. When you're going through difficulty and the enemy is dragging you into the deep waters of adversity, you don't run from the Bible, you run to the Bible. You don't run from God, you run to God. It's not time for you to freeze. You with me? It's time for you to make movement towards God. And so if you're having difficulty with that, if you find yourself avoiding God, perhaps it's intentional, perhaps it's an undercurrent. Jesus said, come unto me, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden. He's saying to us, get out of the water, come to me. Just put your hand out. I know you're screaming because the shark has your leg. Put your hand out, come unto me, and I will drag you back to the environment where you can thrive. The third one, difficulty engaging relationships. I'm going to talk about romantic relationships. Difficulty connecting with family, connecting with friends, connecting with coworkers. When you're in this environment and you're raised, we see this sometimes in the young adults. We see it in the adolescent ages and in the teenage years where our children begin to not to connect to the individuals who were uh, uh, figures in their life. They were, these were engaging in solid relationship. They begin to have relationships that are outside of the environment that produces fruit. Some avoid it because they have fear of rejection, fear of being hurt. Mark chapter 12, verse 31, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, there is no other commandment greater than these. This is the second commandment that Jesus gives. And, um, and he's just simply saying that when there's a rupture, there are things that show you the atmosphere. And the last one is indecisive or worry in making decisions. This means that you could be under, under a spirit of fear, an affliction of fear, where the enemy can be paralyzing you when making a decision. James says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask unto me. If you feel paralyzed to make a decision, some people, they, they go back and forth and they have a difficulty making a decision. Decisions that are rooting, rooted in Christ Jesus. When you pray about a situation and God gives you a solution, you should no longer be indecisive in that decision. Does that make sense? When God called me to ministry, even though I was, it seemed as though everything on the outward appearance was not conducive for me to be successful in ministry, I was too young. I didn't come from the right side of the train track. I didn't, wasn't allotted opportunity. Yet God called me into ministry and he made way for me and I didn't want to be indecisive. I made the decisions God wanted me to and God showed up faithful. He showed up faithful. Others look at it in the back and say, well, that was the miraculous hand of God in conjunction with the radical decision-making of me. Right? It was radical for Peter to get out of the boat. Peter was a player in walking on water. God was the sustainer of walking on water, but Peter needed faith because Jesus wasn't going to kick him out of the boat. Ministry and success is coupled between you and God working together. God says, get out of the boat. Don't be indecisive. Jump, jump, jump. We have our little grandson at home. And, and uh, we put him in a swing. We had a swing in the backyard. And the first day we put him in a swing, I swung him. He was like, no, no, grandpa, no, grandpa. Stop, stop. He was fearful of the swing. So I had to hold on to his leg and swing him back, swing him back, swing him back. And he kept saying, stop, stop, stop. It's like the only word he knew. Two days later, we were swinging him. Woo! He was going all the way up, screaming on the way down. Woo! Does that make sense? He was no longer indecisive when it came or worry in factoring those things. The fear of the Lord, one thing that you should fear is in Psalm 110, verse 10, 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
the fear of the Lord. That's the only instruction that you should fear in Scripture that the Lord says. And the fear here is not fear of his affliction, but fear of being disconnected from him. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so this is what Jesus exemplifies in being tempted by the enemy. The first Adam is tempted by the serpent. The second Adam, Jesus, tempted also by the serpent. And Jesus stands his ground. He deals with intimidation and manipulation. He deals with these things. He deals with the onslaught of the demonic onslaught of Satan himself, and he resists that, and he doesn't move his environment. Even though the atmosphere is not conducive for him to be successful, he's in the wilderness. He's fasted for 40 days. He's hungry. I fast for two hours. I'm hungry. I'm hungry now. I'm looking at Dom and all I'm thinking, chicken parm. You know what I'm saying? Just like, I mean, I see you, you're wonderful, but I see chicken parm. You know, you know and so Jesus, 40 days, the enemy comes with bread. He's trying to get Jesus off the environment, the environment that Jesus is to be successful in. First onslaught of the enemy, Fear. If you're going to be successful as a believer, especially in the 21st century, especially over the next four to five years, I'm a believer that we are in, well, let me just put it this way. We're closer to the last days than the generation before us. Whether you believe you're in the last, I don't even want to deal with that theologically. Here's what I know. When you get to Thanksgiving, you're closer to Christmas than you were in June. Right? You're closer. I could tell you with prophetic certainty, we are closer to the second coming than the Apostle Paul was. And based on that, the enemy will use fear, intimidation, and manipulation in order to get you in an environment that you should not be. When you go to the sands of the sea and the shark comes out and says, hey, would you like to swim with me? Right? Tells you when the great white says, I'm your friend, don't confuse him for a dolphin. Because he's going to do what's in his nature. At some point, he's going to bite you. We had a German shepherd years ago. It was a body dog. I'll close with this. It was, uh, was, we got this dog from Czechoslovakia. It was a body guard dog and you couldn't rough house with the dog because it it didn't know its own strength so so you'd begin to play with the dog and it just want to bite then and, and so you knew the limitations of your affection and his her affection for you because you knew that in its nature that particular dog it wanted to rough house that's what it wanted to do that it did its job very well so we need to recognize that you cannot be a friend of the devil. Young people, you're in here today. You need to guard your environment. When you go off to college, you need to bring the environment of the Holy Spirit with you. Because the halls of higher education are not higher. Call it lower education. Craftiness in the dark arts of manipulation and intimidation. Propaganda at its highest form. And you could be at church singing in the choir as a 16-year-old girl on fire for God. But if you start hanging out at the nightclubs, I will tell you that that environment is not conducive for you to thrive. And the enemy will be there luring you trying to get you, trying to get the lion out of the environment of the land and into the waters. So many things try to deceive the next generation. And we that have gone before them should be boundaries for them. It should be, we used to go up to this place years ago, our leadership team, um, about a couple hours away. 
And I know I said I'll close with it, but I will close with this. And, and do you remember going through the valleys? We used to go to the side of cliffs. I, I'm afraid of heights, so this, this road to the side of the cliffs and everything, they would have uh, guardrails on. I thanked God for the guardrails. Guardrails were not intended. The people who put the guardrail up weren't trying to quench your driving skill. Their motive was not, well, you know, we're going to make, we're going to put a guardrail up because we don't want them to drive on air. They're not trying to stop you from driving. They're trying to keep you driving. Those of us that have gone before the next generation were to be guardrails. Stand with me this morning. I'm going to close with that. It is with-